The UCLA Institute of Transportation Studies acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, where the UCLA campus lies today. We also recognize that the UCLA Lake Arrowhead Conference Center sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, the Ujaviatam people. We would like to thank the sponsors of the 2020 UCLA Arrowhead Symposium online series. Their support enables us to bring you today's program. In particular, we thank the National Center for Sustainable Transportation for their support as this session sponsor. This is an interactive session. To participate in this session, use Zoom's built-in chat, Q&A, and raise hand features. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. My name is Charles Brown. I'm a senior researcher and adjunct professor at the, at the Edward J. Blasey School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University. I would like to welcome each and every one of you to this morning's session titled, How Can We Do Better? Limits on Black Mobility and Transportation. I am joined by a dynamic panel of Black professionals throughout the country. Tamika Butler, founding principal of Tamika L. Butler Consulting LLC. Veronica Davis, co-owner and principal of Inspire Green. Nidra Deadweiler, CEO of Civil Bikes, Obai Reed, President and CEO of Equiticity, and Irene Marion, Equity and Inclusion Manager at PBOT in Oregon. I would like to kick things off with uh, my presentation, which is entitled, which is titled Arrested Mobility, Exploring the Adverse Social, Political, and Economic Health Outcomes of Overpolicing Black Mobility in the US. In order to start, I think it's very important to state why focus on race and ethnicity in transportation. Um, I'm focusing on race and ethnicity in transportation because too often uh, race is not centered in the transportation mobility discussion. However, proxies such as income, access to vehicles, age, gender, et cetera, are used. And when you consider this, um, it doesn't necessarily stand up against the needs and the experiences of black and brown people throughout this country. So we've decided to center race in order to focus specifically on it today in our discussion. And of course, you cannot talk about race without talking about equity. And what equity involves is trying to understand and give people what they need to enjoy full, healthy lives. Equity is also the presence of justice and fairness within the procedures, the processes, and distribution of resources by institutions or systems. Facing equity, however, requires an understanding of the underlying or the root causes of inequality and oppression within our society. I've been quoted as saying that transportation has been weaponized as a tool of oppression within our society. And I don't make that statement without having evidence to support it such as evidence showing that highway robbery has taken place throughout America. Here is one example of historic Treme in New Orleans, Louisiana. Or you could simply follow the highways interstate system anywhere throughout the country, and you'll find evidence of the destruction that the highway system has call, caused in black and brown communities. You can also see the devastation that has been caused due to um, transportation's impact or mobility's impact on, on climate change and and others. I was fortunate and both unfortunate to have survived Hurricane Katrina 
as well as Hurricane Sandy in New Jersey. And so equity then also shows up in terms of its impact, or I should say um, the importance of race in transportation shows up in terms of who is most at risk. You look at the stats and it shows that older adults, people of color, and people walking in low-income communities are disproportionately represented in the fatal crashes involving people of color. And so involving people walking, I mean, and so also when you look at the stats, it shows that adults, older adults relative with the relative age of 50 or older are more than a third higher than the general population in terms of um, being involved in pedestrian crashes. Then when you look at people of color between 2008 and 2017, black and African Americans were 72% more likely to have been struck and killed by drivers while walking. And then for those living in low income neighborhoods, people who lived in neighborhoods where the medium household income is 36,000 or less, they were killed at a much higher rate than their counterparts. Public health is starting to understand this sort of connection. Unfortunately, historically, they've looked straight at risk behaviors. Have people been smoking? Do they have low physical activity, drug use, et cetera? then that sort of connection to disease and injury, and then lastly, mortality. Finally, they're starting to say that, hold on a second, there's also connections to the living conditions of the built environment and what it does in terms of risk behaviors. But then the institution inequities and social inequities also impact the living conditions in which we live in, leading to these risk behaviors, disease and injury, and mortality. And so the equity implications and what we're starting to see then is that race is starting to determine place, which determines one's health. So what you find is that this history doesn't say goodbye. This history says see you later. And the later is now. In the context of there being a plethora of federal, state and local initiatives, plans and programs across, across the country who have been trying desperately to get more black and brown people to be physically active. They've also been trying um, to get them to utilize more options such as bicycling, e-scooters, et cetera, but it hasn't achieved the results that they've been seeking to achieve. And one of the more notable um, efforts around this is the Active People Healthy Nations, which has an overarching goal to help 27 million people become more physically active by 2027, with the understanding that physical activity can, of course, improve their physical health, their quality of life, and reduce healthcare costs. However, when you look at this program, as well as many of the programs and attempts across this country to improve mobility of black and brown people throughout this country, you find that they're ahistorical and apolitical. They don't look at the need or the harm caused by discriminatory law enforcement. They have these sort of tangible organizational um, statements around equity, equity, but no connection to the actual funding or support of black and brown communities to bring about change. Few, if any, state or list this sort of unconscious bias and criminalization of blackness that exists within society. And then many, of course, are advocating for diversity, equity, and inclusion. But of course, oftentimes this is limited internally as well as externally. And then they frame this as a problem of social determinants of health, not recognizing that this is political determinants of health. And so I would like to introduce to you an assertion, and this assertion is arrested mobility. A real arrested mobility is this assertion that black people and other minorities have been historically and presently denied by legal and illegal authority, the inalienable right to move, to be moved, or to simply exist in public space. This, of course, results in adverse social, political, economic, and health effects that are widespread, preventable, and intergenerational. And arrested mobility uh, considers or takes place because of four different realms of racism. It starts with the personal, moves to the interpersonal, institutional, and cultural. That then leads to over-policing via policy, self deputization of white citizens, and law enforcement, which impacts the travel modes, whether we're walking, biking, driving, taking public transit, hopping in rides here, or mic mobility, thus leading to these adverse outcomes such as social, political, economic, and health, and then of course, lower life expectancy and disparities in infant mortality. 
So when you look at it again, the policy piece, arrested mobility happens via policy due to policies such as redlining, residential segregation, disinvestment, et cetera. It happens again via self deputization of white citizens, such as quote unquote Karens, and then the more traditional form, which is through law enforcement. It also happens, though, regardless of age uh, of the child or the party involved. For instance, the research will show really quickly here that uh, children as young as three have been over policed in cities throughout America. And that happens whether they're riding a bicycle or riding their father's back. So is there evidence, you may ask, to support this arrest of mobility across the different modes of transportation? Yes, there is. And it begins first by looking at some of the more notable cases. The first one involves Ahmaud Aubrey, Trayvon Martin, and then Mike Brown. If you can recall, Ahmaud Aubrey was killed while jogging, Trayvon Martin while walking, and Mike Brown while walking as well. Two of them were killed by law enforcement. I mean, one of them was killed by law enforcement, Mike Brown, but Trayvon Martin and Ahmaud Aubrey were killed by self deputized white citizens in America. So what does the research say? The research shows that 55% of the tickets issued in Jacksonville to black individuals um, were issued to black individuals, even though only 29% of the total population identified as blacks. And blacks were three times more likely to receive these tickets than whites in Jacksonville during the study Walking Wild Black. We also found that residents of the city's three poor zip codes were about six times as likely to have received a citation. And then in one of the cases, rape Rachel Nelson, a black single mother in Atlanta, lost her son in a hit and run while crossing the street, later to find that a man who had killed her son had admitted to drinking and taking painkillers on the night he killed him. Well, what about biking? There are many cases uh, <clears throat> of arrest and mobility across biking. What I'll quickly do now is go through some example of those. One of the more notable ones it happened in Chicago where twice as many citations are written in majority black neighborhoods than in majority white or Latino neighborhoods. In fact, 321 bicycle tickets were issued in Austin, uh, which is a low income majority black community, whereas only five were issued in Lincoln Park, a wealthy majority community. And also in Tampa, police issued over 10,000 bicycle tickets. 79% of them were issued to African-Americans and they make up less than 30% of the population. I wish though that I could say arrest and mobility in there. It also goes over to public transit as well. Um, the data shows that in 2017, African-Americans were eight times as likely as whites to be charged for certain transit violations in Portland, Oregon. One example out of New York included Adrian Napier, a black teenager who was tackled and aimed at by 10 police officers for fare evasion. The fare was only $2.75. I wish, though, that I could say it ends there, but it also goes over into driving. In the case of Philando Castile and Sandra Bland, who were birthed, murdered um, while driving or as a result of driving. The data shows that Black and Hispanic drivers are stopped disproportionately to white drivers, and police are less likely to pull over Black drivers at the dusk when the race of the driver is less obvious. In a case in Minneapolis, which has been in the news lately, in 2006, 47% of the arrests by the St. Anthony Police Department um, were black individuals, even though the patrol area is only about 7% black. We wish we could say it ended with uh, driving, but it doesn't. It also goes into ride sharing as well. Well, the data shows that 55% of the blacks who call for a cab at some point have experienced a refusal by the service to even send a cab to their community. And then lastly, we know that arrest and mobility happens whether one is sleeping in their home or simply playing in a playground, such as our sister Brianna Taylor and this young king or prince here, Tamir Rice. So really quickly, what are some of the adverse social, political and economic, uh, I mean, in health outcomes of arrest and mobility? Well, in short, what we find is that blacks are 54 percent less likely to be physically active than whites, regardless of neighborhood and regardless of the racial composition of the neighborhood or income of the neighborhood. We also know that ride share fares tend to be higher for drop offs in black communities such as Chicago neighborhoods 
And then we know that res res residential segregation has led to a dearth of hospitals and healthcare providers in majority black and Hispanic areas. And then lastly, we see the impacts of segregation as segregation discernibly affects educational attainment for blacks much higher than whites. And in terms of the political context, we're finding that because of their transportation disadvantageness, this makes them more vulnerable to disenfranchisement efforts like a lower density of polling places, which is then exacerbate the lack of representation in the government. So to close, what are some strategies to address these issues? We would like to see reparation style infrastructure packages for black communities that must include bicycle infrastructure investment, pedestrian infrastructure investment, public transit and public art. We also would like to see enhanced police accountability, the elimination of the scary black male narrative and more data, especially in the context of transportation for black lives and experiences. And when we say data, we're not biased towards quantitative or qualitative data. We think there needs to be more in both categories. Also, we must begin to penalize the race-based 911 calls and eliminate these sort of racialized zoning practices. Whites also have to be more courageous. You'll hear a lot of discussions about well-meaning right whites in the context of transportation and um, improving equity among black and brown communities but we need you to be more courageous when it comes to the fact that our mobility has been arrested. And of course, mental health services must be a part of this as you'll hear in today's discussion, but these are some concrete strategies that can be done to kind of start to eradicate issues around arrested mobility. And of course, this is important because if you don't know or not, black people are tired, they can't go jogging, they can't walk to the corner store, they can't get a normal traffic ticket, they can't have a disabled vehicle, they can't breathe, they can't run, they can't live. And so please consider in the context of transportation as you're advancing, biking, walking, et cetera, you must first allow your consciousness to be arrested, to understand that our mobility has been arrested. So I wanna thank you for your time. That presentation has a lot to it. There's a lot more to offer there. But given the amount of time we have today, I now want to turn things over to Tamika Buck. Thanks, Charles. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome. Good afternoon for some of you in different places. It's been great to see um, all the conversation in the chat. Remember, if you're putting things in the chat, which we encourage you to do throughout, make sure you are sending stuff to panelists and attendees. Um, not just panelists. I am going to share my screen. I'm going to compliment what um, what Charles just talked about, and and share a little bit about you know why why we all came together and the way this impacts um, folks on this plant panel um, beyond just you know when we're out walking or biking. Um, we want to talk about rethinking white spaces. And, 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 and shift this arrested mobility conversation to the arrested mobility that happens for so many of us folks of color. And again, this is a rare panel of all black panelists. And so, you know, as we came together and we talked about this panel, we really thought about how we think about rethinking um, white spaces um, as specifically um, black people. So, you know, I like to tell you a little bit what I'm going to do. I like to set clear expectations. I'm going to go very briefly through what I'm doing now. And I know a lot of folks who are here, um, but there are some new things going on with me. And then we're going to talk a little bit about <laughs> what brought us all together, um, especially for those who might have some knowledge of Lake Arrowhead last year, um, and then talk about what folks can do themselves to confront power and privilege. And so, um, you know, I'm Tamika, love riding my bike. I think that's how I come to transportation work. Um, I think that's, um, you know, what it is for me, the feeling of being on my bike and feeling just like I was a kid, feeling free. And when you think about what Charles said about arrested mobility, something I love so much that has brought me to this profession, feeling free, but knowing that because of my blackness, that is sometimes impossible. And again, that's both out in the world writ large, but that's also in this professional space. Um, and part of feeling like I didn't have that mobility prompted me to start my own consulting company and to really um, 
to really focus on the things um, that I wanted to do um, and, and the things that would make me happy. And I think that this is something um, that more and more you're seeing um, talented folks who are part of marginalized groups um, going out and, and starting their own thing. Um, and so I'm happy to be one of those small business owners. So what do I mean by a white space? I have about 18 minutes um, to walk you through what, you know, Charles talked about what's going on in the built environment. And so I'm going to talk about what's going on in our professional environment. First, when we look at the planning professions, what we know is that 80% of urban and regional planners are white. That's, that's not a typo. That's not a stutter. That is 80%. And if, if these slides are small on your screen, you can maximize them. Um, and there are going to be a lot of small slides, but the, the numbers shouldn't be surprising, right? And, and there are more white people in our profession than there are <laughs> represented in the United States, right? Like white people are not only the most predominant ways, race, they are also overrepresented. And that's just not as an industry of a whole. It's any, um, any industry you think of. One of today's sponsors, uh, Transit Center, um, which I'm on the board of, so I use uh, this, this tool they put together a lot, who, who rules transit? They've already told us that transit agencies are major employers, right? We know that. They provide a service and they're major employers. We have folks here today from transit agencies. And the reality is the demographics of transit agencies don't match those who ride, right? Um, we know that women and people of color and people with low incomes are riding, but those are not the people overseeing these organizations. Women are only 39% of transit agency workforce, less than 5% of the agency CEOs are women. And we know the boards are predominantly white with just two CEOs among the 15 largest US agencies uh, when, when this study was done. When we think about transportation, our favorite friend in transportation right now is the tech industry, right? Uber and Lyft, we talk about them all the time, whether or not we're talking about ride hailing, whether or not we're talking about scooters. And if you can't see the text, I can promise you the overall global gender representation, there are more men than women, right? It's 59% to 40%. There are more white people, 44.7%. Um, than, than any other racial demographic. And that's their overall representation. When you look at their leadership, it gets worse. 72% of the leadership is men, 59.9% white. And it's not much different when you head over to Lyft, right? You see that that biggest circle, that blue circle, that's the population of white folks in the profession. And, and that again, gets, even more exaggerated when you look at the leadership. Now, I could have shared the, the demographics for any of the sponsors, right? We have private consulting firms. Um, we have academic institutions, which is another area. I did a presentation at Penn, right? Great design school on, on the East Coast. Um, and I was sharing with them that, you know, overall, they have this makeup of folks where a majority of the folks coming in to get degrees at the program are white. And like many folks of color who are thinking about going to grad school, I'm one of them, right? Thinking about getting my PhD. One of the first things you do is go to the website and you scroll and you scroll and you scroll and you're like, oh, there's the first black person I see, right? It takes a lot of scrolls to get there. And then when you keep scrolling, you realize that by the time you get to the end of the professors, there were only two black faces. And most of these folks were men, right? And it's not any different when we think about UCLA, right? Now UCLA in some ways might be able to say like, hey, they're in LA and they do a better job of talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. They have this great picture here. Um, any student of color who's ever been in higher education knows that when sometimes you might need support, you might need help, and you don't know where to go. But when the school needs diverse pictures, they always know how to follow you. I would argue that when I look at UCLA's website, 
I see more of a commitment than just pictures, right? I see a commitment to social justice. I see a commitment to being real about disparities and trying to fix them. And, and so as you're looking through the site, you see that. But again, you look at the demographics of folks of color and there are still more white students. And as a black student, it still feels like, yo, that's a really low number, right? And the faculty is better. You're on that first scroll and already there's some, you know, interesting things happening here with, with ethnic backgrounds. There's some women, right? Like it feels like it's going to be better. But again, you scroll and you're like, okay, okay, maybe there's more folks of color and you keep going and then you get to the end. And as a black person, you again realize you saw one black person. And even though in a super diverse place like UCLA, this faculty might look better for the population of the city that we're in, it just isn't good enough, which isn't surprising that then last year, many of us participated in this conference at Lake Arrowhead. It was beautiful. It was awesome. I was out there living my best life, taking pictures, wearing my melanated, educated, an opinionated shirt. And what became very clear to me, and I think a few folks of color who were there, is that everyone was excited about us being melanated. Everyone was excited about us being educated. Folks were a little less excited about us being opinionated. And so it was this whole conference that was focused on connecting equity and transportation. That was the point, it was ambitious, it was bold, and many of the speakers there were able to make connections to this issue. And in a lot of ways, the content that I heard last year helped expand my mind, helped me grow, was one of the you know starting factors to make me think, maybe I wanna pursue a career in higher education. And then, the conference ended and that's when things went sideways, right? We were supposed to hear from speakers to talk about what they heard. And what we heard from the last speaker is that there was a lot of conversation about equity. There was a lot of conversation from folks of color and gender queer folks. And it was a bit in the face of people. And folks were happy to call a conference the intersection of transportation and equity. But as soon as we said, is there an option for folks of color to really take space, to really be their bold, authentic selves, the feeling in the room for many of us, particularly the Black folks, particularly the women of color, particularly the Black women, is that that option of having us participate and participate as our full selves just wasn't an option that folks were interested in. They wanted us in the room, but they didn't want us to fully participate, right? And all of a sudden, there were all these minds who had come together, transportation people who all love transportation, who all came to this idyllic setting to talk about equity and transportation. It was like you, when you first got in the room, you were like, these are my people. We're all in the same place. And then all of a sudden, all the folks that you looked around and you're like, these are the folks that I agree with. These are the folks who help me. These are the folks who I help. All of a sudden, folks who used to be on the same page weren't on the same page. And typically, I am a person who likes to move on, right? We, in some ways, we have moved on. Charles and I are back. We're participating. We're kicking off because we are not people who just like to poo-poo things and not try to make them better. And we have worked hard with the organizers at Lake Arrowhead to make things better. Maddie and Juan and Brian and, you know, Evie, like we have had conversations and we are trying to move forward. And, and part of what was so shocking for us is that it took some time to start having those conversations. Even though so much happened last year, we didn't start really having those conversations until a few months ago. And it seemed like now it was more pressing than ever because now there are two major crises in our country. And I share this picture all the time because when we are thinking about public space, when we are thinking about land use, and when so many of us are sitting in meetings and conferences talking about how we can expand the sidewalks so that restaurants can open back up and survive, we aren't really trying to talk about the way that in addition to this being a pandemic, this is a country in where white supremacy takes no breaks. A pandemic cannot stop racism and anti-Blackness, right? 
And beyond that, a pandemic couldn't stop us from ignoring equity. These sidewalk dining things may be great, but if you're in a wheelchair and your whole sidewalk is taken up, is that space for you? And if you are a Black person in the streets asking just for folks to see your humanity, all of a sudden you are being targeted as a looter, as a problem starter, not as someone who is trying to creatively use public space. And people want to pretend like this is something new, but as Charles already told you, we've been hunted. We already know. And every aspect of this work for folks who say, why are we talking about so much blackness and arrested mobility? I mean, I say, did you watch Charles's presentation? He hit you in the first slide, like while we're talking about this. But beyond that, social justice and racism and anti-blackness have always been core to transportation work, have always been core to all we do. Some of you here might say, I'm here because I care about transportation. And I don't really know how these other issues come into play. But for those of us who do this work, who are people of color, who are part of other oppressed groups, for those of us who do this work and inhabit Black bodies, we know that whether or not we're talking about transportation, or we're talking about the criminal justice system, or we're talking about environmental racism and the zoning in our communities, whether or not we're talking about school segregation, or whether or not we're going back to the beginning, this book that everybody loves, that I love, that I've read, that I have a copy of, right? Like this redlining still persists. It is a forgotten history of how our government segregated in America, but forgotten for who? For many of us, it's not forgotten. For many of us, it's real, right? It's, it's still happening. And again, all of this in the context of a pandemic where our folks are dying at a higher rate, where you would be hard pressed to find black folks who don't know someone who's been sick, who's died, or who has never stopped working because they are an essential worker. We're talking about this in a place where I will never watch the George Floyd video, but I have seen this picture and I know that the green bike lane and the great infrastructure in Minneapolis did not save his life as he begged for his mother and his last breath. Charles already told you about folks in our communities who can't walk, who can't run, and who can't ride their bike without dying. And so when folks who aren't like us come to conferences and idyllic settings and want to go hang out at the lake and wonder, why we're being so in people's faces about our blackness, about our queerness, about anything. You have to ask yourself, why aren't you thinking about these things? When academics get together and pontificate about their research and private firms get together and talk about upcoming projects with government agencies and folks politic and exchange information and talk about how they're going to be more successful in the future and how the conference literally helps them do that because it brings together an elite group of people. Some of us are thinking, am I going to be more successful? And will people one day learn my name because I've been more successful or will they only learn it when I am part of a list? And for many of us, again, whether or not it's showing up at a Zoom call or whether or not it's being in the field or whether or not it's just sitting in silence, all we can think about is the fact that we're not okay. But too often in these white spaces, we have to ask, but does anybody care? And sometimes we ask the white folks, like, do you care? And when we say, do you care, instead of getting an answer back to our questions, what we get back is this response that they're not racist, that they just don't necessarily know if the things we're saying are real problems. Because when things aren't problems to folks personally, they tend to think they're not real if they can't see the data, if they haven't experienced it. And that's a privilege that every day you don't have to think about the fact that the only thing you want is for folks to stop killing us. And so if you're coming to this conference this year, knowing the context of what's going on around the world and in our community, 
if you are coming to this conference just because you like tea and you wanted to see how UCLA and Lake Arrowhead were going to handle last year, rolling into this year, or if you don't have a clue as to what I'm talking about from last year, but you just came because you wanted to be part of something, then you have to start asking yourself what you can do to make these spaces feel like they are places that are not just white spaces, but spaces where those of us who come and don't have that whiteness as a shield, don't have that whiteness as a privilege, and don't have that whiteness as a way to get instant, instant credibility. You have to ask yourself what you can do to make this space not just another white space in the transportation. The reality is you have to start by realizing that to be young, gifted, and Black is amazing. I'm about to finish speaking, and you're about to hear from a bunch of dope, young, gifted, and Black folks. We are generous with young, but Black don't crack, so you'll never know. And once you realize that to be young, gifted, and Black is amazing, you also have to realize how hard it is to be young, gifted, and Black, to be young, gifted, and a person with a disability, to be young, gifted, and Indigenous, and realize that as I sit here on stolen Tongva land, everybody's talking about land use and planning, but no one's talking about the fact that the land doesn't belong to them. If you are young, gifted, and undocumented, if you are young, gifted, and part of any oppressed group, you know how hard it is. And if you are not part of those groups, then don't get caught up in our struggle only. Acknowledge the beauty and the brilliance of what we do, but then realize that it is difficult. It's so difficult. The Harvard Business Review did a whole issue on why African-Americans are still vastly underrepresented in many U.S. organizations, right? And part of the reason is, it's just the ways of white folks. Like, it is hard for white folks to imagine giving up power. And they don't realize that we're code switching. We are constantly doing this thing where we might change up the way we're talking or how we're dressing or how we're acting because of what others view as more professional. Code switching for many of us is seen as crucial for professional advancement, but it comes at a psychological cost. And if leaders are serious about promoting inclusion and addressing social inequality and equities, they have to begin with understanding that for a part of the workforce, we can't be ourselves in the office. We can't be ourselves at the conference. We can't be ourselves at the happy hour. And then addressing how everyone has to change for that not to be the case. Folks have to understand that organizational segregation is persistent and whiteness is always a key credential for moving up. Leaders have to stop thinking about discrimination and inequities and inequalities as rare events. It's not like last year's conference just happened because it was a rare event. Folks have to understand that racial processes shape behavior in the absence of ill intent. Conversations around racism need to refocus from narrow concerns and feelings about racial incidents and really tackle systemic problems. Folks have to get away from just thinking about diversity for diversity's sake, just thinking about a clip art picture of diverse faces. Folks have to realize that you can't get to equity if you don't have inclusion. And to have inclusion, you have to relinquish power. And the folks who have historically had power, and often those are white men in this profession, you have to be willing to let it go, right? Because this picture is obsolete. We should be fighting for liberation and beyond liberation, we should be thinking about power and who had the power to determine that what folks wanted was to watch baseball game. We should be redistributing power so that folks can self-determine what they want to do, what makes them free. And we should stop only liking folks of color in this profession if they are invisible. Because if you don't know the problem of women of color in the workplace, I can guarantee there are people on the Zoom call, there are people in your organization who know what it's like to enter an organization where there is white leadership and don't confuse white leadership with white people. Because white leadership is anything that has given in to centering whiteness, just like women can lead in certain ways that are patriarchal because they've been taught for years that that's the only way to advance. Non-white folks can... Didn't demonstrate white leadership. 
And when folks of color come into an organization and they meet that white leadership, everybody's happy. Everyone says, oh, we want to welcome you here. This is an inclusive environment. But often it's just tokenizing. The reality sets in once the person of color and particularly the woman of color, particularly black women, start pointing out issues. As happened last year, right? We started pointing out some things that might not be great about transportation, about the conference. We tried to work within the structure and the policies. We pushed for accountability. And then all of a sudden, there is repetitive injury. There are microaggressions. And when it is brought to the folks in power's attention, they deny that it is racism. They ignore it. They blame that person. The responsibility of fixing the problem is placed on the person, but they don't have any power to fix the problem. And often, for good measure, the people of color or the people in marginalized groups are pitted against each other. And then the organization retaliates. All of a sudden, you're told you weren't professional. All of a sudden, you're not invited anymore. All of a sudden, you get a little write-up in your file. All of a sudden, your professor thinks you're just not scholarship material. You are labeled as a conflict communication issues are thrown around. People say it's not a good fit and folks leave the organization. And this has to stop. There has to be change. We have to create brave spaces where folks can show up as their authentic selves. That even means white folks who have to acknowledge the limit of their expertise and that they will make mistakes. We have to understand that power is at play. We have to stop trying to empower folks of color. We have to understand that they have power. We have to work with them. And folks who have historically had power have to relinquish some of it. If you are in a decision-making position, you have to ask yourself if the decisions you're making and the people who are impacted are the same people making those decisions, are the people who have the most to risk making the decisions. And if not, you have to check the power. You have to check the privilege. Whose data matters? Who are we considering? And when you think this is just a conference or this is just transportation, always remember what Audre Lorde said, because Black women are always right. There is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't lead single issue lives. Thank you. We're gonna move over to a panel presentation where we're gonna have a conversation amongst black folks. We're gonna invite y'all in to our kitchen table, to our stoop. And we are going to talk about how arrested mobility shows up in the built environment and how it shows up in our professional environment. So if I can get Veronica and Irene, everybody, there we go. Slow, slow, Nedra. Who else we missing? Where's my homie from Chicago? Oh boy. <laughs> All right, back to you, Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Tamika. That was uh, dynamic as always. Uh, we are going to bring on Chanel Fletcher here soon, but my first question to, to each of you actually goes back to the title of our talk, which is, how can we do better? Limits on Black mobility and transportation. So in your own words, how do you feel we can do better? And feel free to define what you consider the we to be in the context of today's discussion. I would like to start with Veronica, move to Nidra, Irene, Obai, and then Tamika. Veronica, how can we do better and who is we? So good afternoon, everybody. Um, so the we, in this case, um, for me, I'm an engineer. So I'm gonna go with the engineering community as the we, um, and just the overarching um, transportation departments as a whole. And how they can do better for the Black community is just investing in the Black community. I think that a lot of cities, um, big, small, or otherwise, are always trying to slice up the pie to make sure every community gets something. Um, but the rich communities, uh, which also largely tend to be white, are very have been very politically savvy. And so they know how to funnel that money to their community. You know, even as we talk about Vision Zero, uh, the savvy communities have been able to use Vision Zero for every little problem they have from a minor sidewalk issue to whatever. Um, but largely the data, as Charles shared, you know, as Tamika shared, we are we can we can crunch these numbers a thousand ways for Monday. But at the end of the day, it's still the black and brown communities 
that are constantly suffering. And even as we come up with new programs, somehow that money never trickles down. And so at this point, it comes down to making bold decisions that this is what we are going to fund and we are going to put the necessary resources into these communities so that they can be safer and make better engineering decisions. And part of that means trade-offs of you know, supporting people to be able to get to a bus stop. At the bus stop, having a, having a bus shelter with a bench. You know, it's all those little things um, to help make mobility easier. And that may mean, you know, people are just going to have to sit in traffic a little bit longer. But it, it, but it is coming down to trade-offs. And then we're constantly, the trade-off has been people's lives. And so at this point, we need to make a decision that people are important. Black people and brown people are important and that we are going to do what we need to do to keep them alive. Thank you. Nidra, how can we do better? And who is we? Hello, oh, yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you both, uh, to Mika and Charles, for your presentation. Um, I'm going to say that we, uh, Civil Bikes, kind of steps over a couple of boundaries of history, historic preservation, as well as bicycle advocacy. So right now I'm going to speak to white led bike advocacy organizations. Um, I've worked for one and I'm going to say to discontinue practices of tokenizing black, uh, black and brown led bike organizations. Um, we have the capability to speak for ourselves and our communities um, and to really allow for those groups to be the ones to um, interact with city leaders, um, support their leadership, and to also um, put funding into those organizations, um, work with them um, on equal playing field. Um, so that's what I would say is that the we um, needs to do. Thank you. Irene, how can we do better and who is we? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I have two we's. We, um, first, I will start with transportation leadership. So I'm equity manager at the City of Portland's Bureau of Transportation um, and a, one of very few equity managers, I would say, across the country that is actually at the leadership table of our organization. So a few pieces of advice for folks in that space. Um, one, um, it, you know, it starts with financial investment in a couple of different types of ways. Um, there are, we need to bring new voices and new stakeholders to the table to to do this work with us. And that starts to me with me and at PBOT with um, really helping to support however we can to capacitate more black organizations and leaders and advocates um, to be able to join this work with us. The transportation space is very technical, uh, very academic, um, and it's, it's easy for you know, our community leaders to get lost really quickly. So um, I would definitely say invest into the work that really brings them as full partners into your work. Um, the second is I think within our organizations, we really need to create a culture of innovation we are working within systems and we are trained um, to do our work. And that's how a lot of our folks show up. Um, but we need to really support folks who can go beyond what those industry standards are, beyond the training that they've probably received at these types of institutions. And we need to create a culture um, that allows people to use the training and experience that they have and come to our organizations with, but also to push beyond, push the boundaries, um, allowing folks to do what they want to do and need to do um, to really disrupt the work. And then lastly, I would say um, we also need to invest into our own teams. And so uh, to, I'm feeling triggered for like lots of the right reasons, um, but uh, for a lot of hard reasons for me personally. Um, but we got to continue to invest into having equity practitioners in our space who, again, have the training, have the background, have the experience, have the lived experience that they can bring into our work. But we have to really build out the skill set of being an equity practitioner and a disruptor. Um, so we need more people in the space who are paid to do that work as their job and they need resources um, to be able to build out the programs that they need. My second we is Black people, Black people in this space. Um, how can we do better? I think this is a year for many reasons of disreconciliation across the board, but in our communities, um, it's been powerful to see the type of resilience and the type of self-care movement that's happening. And I would just continue to encourage folks to take care of themselves, step up when you can, be bold, brave leaders, um, but also step back when you need to, because it's hard work. I mean, even watching the slides this morning was rough, like to see the faces, to see the names, to 
know that that's my family. Those are my people. That's the community I go home to. That's the people in my household. Um, so it is hard work. So take care of yourselves, love on yourselves and take care of each other. Thank you. Obai, good brother. How can we do better? And who is we? Yo, what up, y'all? Hey, uh, thank you, Charles and Tamika. Those presentations were powerful um, and sadly heartbreaking. Um, all right. Uh, because I respect Tamika so much, I'm going to use her term. White folks. That's the we. That's who I'm talking to. I'm also talking to mainstream organizations, white led organizations, consulting firms who are executing on behalf of cities, carrying their water. I'm talking about universities who are framing up how planning and transportation is executed in our city, creating another generation of planners and transportation professionals who are implicitly biased and executing racist strategies. I'm talking to DOTs and MPOs. I'm talking to funders and the private companies which make up this sector. How do we do better? We need to operationalize a full-throated, sincere, authentic, uncompromising and comprehensive commitment to racial equity and mobility justice. We don't leave that work to well-meaning people. Well-meaning people come and go. We must policy that commitment. We must legislate that commitment. We must begin to distribute resources in a way that's fair and just, explicitly targeting the people who need those resources the most. That is the foundation of racial equity. Anybody who talks about racial equity and not talking about a new way that's fair and just to distribute resources in our society, they are not describing racial equity. We need to make space and shift power. Make space for black, brown, and indigenous people. Shift power intentionally, explicitly away from white people. We need to transform these organizations, these companies um, that, I, that I mentioned the we of, we need to transform them. We need to structurally transform these entities, continuing to give us words, con continuing to write these statements, continuing to placate, placate us with your, uh, your faux commitment to racial equity and mobility justice does nothing for us. We need to know how you're transforming internally to be anti-racist. We don't care about you writing a blog about being anti-racist. Thank you, Obai. Tamika, you have the final word on this. How can we do better? And who is I, we? I mean, I, I, I felt the same way as, as I read. Like, I thought about two different things. When I thought of we, I thought of like other black folks, other folks of color, other queer folks. And I was just like, I don't even know because we are doing the damn thing. <laughs> Like we are like superheroes. And so I don't know how we can do better because what what that often translates to when when folks in power want to give us feedback on how we can do better, what they actually mean is how we can make them more comfortable. And mm -hmm. so I would just co-sign with Irene said, like, this is a long fight. This is a revolution. It is a struggle. And we need you to be well rested. Because so many of us know that everything that's happening now is not much different than what's happening before the pandemic, that was happening before George Floyd. And we know that George Floyd is not the last name, right? We know the pandemic is not the last health crisis that's going to be taking Black and brown lives at a higher rate. Infant mortality rates were already what they were, right? And it didn't matter your income. It didn't matter if your name was Serena Williams. You still had a Black woman giving birth who's like, I almost died, right? And so for me, like when, when I'm thinking about the, the we of the non-oppressed folks, my question is, how can you be honest with yourself about why you didn't see it before? Did mm -hmm. you only see what I put on the slides? Or did you see, when I had that first slide on urban planning, did you see the groups for whom there were no bars? You couldn't even see anybody. And so for me, if you want to do better, then it has to start as we just heard, not with a fancy statement on your website, not with a fancy hire of somebody who is a person of color who you're probably going to take advantage of, tokenize, and then blame them when it doesn't go well. But how do you actually force yourself to see what you previously chose not to see? Because it's not, you can say, well, I just didn't know, or things are just different. But if you didn't know, you chose not to know. So ask yourself why and confront that. 
I would add that the we is or are my brothers and sisters in academia, as well as the uh, practicing planners. Um, I really wanted to arrest your consciousness with that presentation to give you an opportunity to pause, to consider the moment and the time in which we're in. Because this point forward, you will have no excuse not to look at the role that racism, the role that uh, race plays in the way, in the outcomes, in the findings of your research, et cetera. You can no longer ignore it. The facts are here. It's time to recognize it. So what I'm going to do now is shift and bring Chanel Fletcher on, uh, then uh, Mr. Gil Pinalosa. Uh, Chanel has uh, a question of us all, really, about the reparation style infrastructure package that I mentioned. So, Chanel, you have the floor. Um, hi, folks. And so you'll see right behind me, my son is doing distance hi. learning. He's very excited to say hi to everybody. Um, the, the question that I had, and I think, you know, when you started off, it was so powerful to me because in, in California, we just passed a law, had this task force look at and start to assess like what reparations even mean in California. And I feel like transportation is often so siloed from those conversations when we're looking at the state capital and we're looking at the policymakers. And so for me, the question was really one, like, you know, for those of us that are advocates that are really interested in advancing this, like, like what are specific things um, that we can think about and how we can move this forward? Um, and it kind of really starts to mobilize. And the, the second part of that is like, how do we start to break down those silos that we see where it's like transportation agencies are over here, you know, talking about like, well, this kind of infrastructure, and I think, you know, we saw that in the chat a little bit, um, but I'm like, no, we need to be talking about like real like reparations and justice. Um, and so I guess for me, the question is like, how do we start to merge those conversations? Yeah, so my, my quick response to that, Chanel, is that when I speak about transportation, I'm talking about money. Uh, I mean, uh, reparations, I'm, I'm speaking to money, funding going to black communities. Um, because what we see is that black people are disproportionately more likely to be killed. When you look at health disparities throughout this country, you know, our numbers are off the charts. So I'm talking about investment in those communities. We can have a conversation about whether or not that will lead to gentrification and displacement, but quite frankly, I don't want to start there right now. Let's cut the check. It's time to cut the check. So that's where I'm at on that. Others. Um, so I would say, as I mentioned, you know, this work is just so technical, like we have folks that have been on some of our public advisory bodies for 30 years and can argue with our planning teams about the incline that they prefer to ride their bike on. Um, and that's what our team is used to engaging with in public settings. And so in the last few years, and when I came into the organization four years ago, like there was not an existent and kind of um, long-standing relationship with any Black community partner. So coming into the space and coming into the organization in a public involvement role, I kind of made it my mission to change that and bring some of the relationship that I have with my community with me. Um, but with the acknowledgement that there is so much money in this space, there is so much at stake in this space, the way that infrastructure has torn our communities apart, has displaced us, has um, moved us into new parts of town that we're having to get familiar with. There's so many details on it, right? Um, what we have done and where we've started to find some success is partnering with our um, Multnomah County, which is our local county that we sit within and with their health department that's been receiving um, CDC, Center for Disease Control funding to address healthcare disparities in the Black um, population in our county in acknowledgement that the health disparities are so bad that it needed, you know, federal intervention now on a second round of grants. And um, so in this time of COVID, like we have been exploring, how can we bring advocates into the space? Where do we need to show up? Where do we need to go? Who should we be partnering with? How are, how are we having conversations that are both technical in nature and really digging into how we're investing and what the budget process is and how equity and how black people are going to show up in our budget commitments. Um, but also in community to say, like, if we need to have a black transportation academy so that our community partners even have a resource from us on how to engage with us, then that's what we need to invest into. Um, so I would say don't be scared of all kind of the technicality that comes with being an advocate in this space. Um, but you know, really reflect on and advocate for what you need um, and demand that that is a part of what gets the investment. Hey, um, 
Thank you, Irene. That was powerful. Uh, coming from someone who works uh, for DOT, I appreciate your perspective. Um, I agree with Chanel. Um, we certainly need reparations in the uh, context of new, uh, improved transportation resources. I also agree with Charles, cut the check. We got to cut the check. Um, a commitment to re reparation should be implicit and explicit within a commitment to racial equity. As I mentioned, foundational to racial equity is the fair, just distribution of resources, explicitly targeting and prioritizing the mar marginalized racial groups who need those resources the most. We're talking about infrastructure in the context of transportation. We're, al we're also talking about cash that needs to come to black, brown, and indigenous people. Also explicit within the context of racial equity is an acknowledgement of the harms that have been inflicted in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and the repairing of the harms. The repairing of the harms is reparations. You don't repair the harms by just telling us you apologize, which many, an organization, a company, DOT, MPO, have not even done. They haven't even apologized. They haven't, they haven't acknowledged the harms. And because they haven't acknowledged the harms, they, not, they haven't apologized, because what are they apologizing for? Um, and I, I, I say it again because it's critical. I'm probably going to say it a bunch of times. So get ready. A commitment to racial equity needs to be policied and legislated. And within that commitment, it should include reparations. Anybody who wants to better understand how we think about racial equity, go to our Equiticity Racial Equity Statement of Principle, available on our website publicly. We welcome uh, critique. And we'll, that's in draft form. We'll be updating that uh, Racial Equity Statement of Principle soon. Thank you. The other thing I would add, and then I'm happy to, to have us move on. I don't I don't want us all to talk about everything, but we all have so much to say. And it's all so much black brilliance. Um, I think about everything you all said, write the check. <laughs> like, like, let's just get real. I think about what Irene said and how, and how you um, actualize that in practice. And, and I, I believe in all of that. I also think reparations has to come in time. Like, like give us some time and give us some opportunities, right? Because the other thing we need to be repaired upon, like when, when you see a young person of color express themselves and you write that up in an employment file as they're too emotional or they're too angry, first of all, like there's so much there about whether or not a woman is angry or not angry or whatever. But second of all, even if you have a black employee who gets angry, they probably have a right to be angry and they have probably given you so much of their time to listen to your tears, to listen to your concerns, to listen to the things that have made you uncomfortable. The least you can do, because really like we are owed, right? The least you can do is pay us adequately, give us the leadership opportunities, which we are more than qualified for and acknowledge as we just heard, acknowledge the harm that has been done and really realize that part of the reparation is in having concrete changes to your actions and the way in which you interact with us. And that is huge. And, and part of that is giving us the benefit of the doubt sometimes, right? Like I have to acknowledge my privilege that I'm successful, that I have a partner who makes good money, that I am going to be able to get employed. And so I can say things on a panel that many folks wouldn't say, that many students wouldn't say. And I can also acknowledge there's going to be someone who's going to be like, oh, let me email my friend at Penn and tell them Tamika put them at blast and not give the benefit of the doubt that I actually love the folks at Penn, that they have been very supportive of me professionally, that we have struggled, right? But too often folks assume the worst of us. And that's whether or not we're walking down the street, biking down the street, or sitting in our office chair. And so part of the reparations are to change how you treat us and acknowledge that these conceptions of whether or not we're a fit or we fit the profile are often all skewed. Thank you all. 
I now want to give the floor to our good brother, Gil Pinalosa. Gil, you have the floor. Thank you, Charles. And then, Tamika, the two of you are doing an amazing job all over, uh, raising the important issues. And thanks, every one of the panelists. I think that, you know, COVID, COVID arrived and people say everything changed. I don't think almost anything has changed. We, what has happened is that we have a magnifying glass that some issues of equity that were existed before COVID, now all of a sudden they are more visible. <clears throat> but change is hard. Change is not going to happen unless we really demand change and we work on it. I think when Charles was saying about the money, we need that money. I think that doing a little bit like an, an analogy of a soccer field. Before we were not even on the soccer field, we were outside. Now we are on the field and we are passing the ball around and we are getting pretty good at passing the ball. But if the ball doesn't cross the line, we don't score goals. And we need to score many goals. <laughs> and so we need to actually get action from the government. And I think that a year from now, in issues of mobility, is going to be much more difficult than a year ago because we're going to have more cars. The, some people want to have sustainable mobility, walking and riding bicycles and using public transit. But many other people want to have cars and be more segregated and more isolated. So that is, gonna, that is also a huge, a very powerful force. In the U.S., all across the U.S., the used cars are selling like crazy. The new cars are selling. So, so, so let's don't think for a minute that this change is going to be easy. And, and I think that, for example, now we have a small window of opportunity, and I think that we, we must work very, very hard <clears throat> to take advantage of that window of opportunity because the economic crisis is going to be gigantic afterwards. And there is going to be lots of money for very few topics and almost nothing for lots of it. So we, got, we need to see how to make sure that the, little, that the few projects with lots of money, that they have the equity issue on it, that, that we have issues related to race, to ethnicity. And last comment I wanna make is, let's, let's also engage the Hispanic community, the Latinx community, the Hispanic, there's over 60 million Hispanics in the US. And usually they are not at the table. And the Hispanics are having a lot of similar discrimination as black people. In California, in the last 20 years, the people killed by the police in California, 42% are Hispanics. So there's a lot of issues that, 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 that are similar. And if we have a wider tent, I think that, that, that it, it might be easier. I've worked in more than 350 different countries in the world and everywhere I see the issue of equity where the low income, some places the discrimination is by race, in others by religion, in others by gender, in others by, but a, a common denominator is the, is the issue of equity. Like with COVID, when people say that in New York, the Hispanics and the black are dying overwhelmingly, it's not the Hispanics and the black, it's the poor Hispanics and the poor black. The wealthy ones are working from home and they are not, and, and they are not dying. And the last comment is, I, I invite you to, let's demand these changes, not about cycling, not about public transit, not about walking, but about the benefits. Because the benefits are a lot more unifying. Why do we wanna have networks of protected bikeways? It's not so that cyclists are gonna be happy. No, it's because we wanna have climate change and we wanna have mental and physical health and we wanna have economic development. So there is a, a, a lot of things. I think that if we focus on the benefits, uh, we're gonna do very well, but, but, but it's not gonna be easy and we need to develop a sense of urgency. Let's not think for a minute that the minds of the decision makers have, all of a sudden have been transformed uh, if we don't, if we don't put the pressure, uh, it, it will not happen. Thank you, thank you, Gil. Thank you. Um, we we all agree. And just for those who are who are watching, when we are having conversations about the ills against Black people, it doesn't mean at all we're anti any other people. What we do know is that these conversations about the Black struggle do not happen enough within the transportation context. So it's very important to kind of shine a light on that, uh, because that is something that has not happened historically. Um, you can attest to this, 
that all across the globe prior to COVID happening, there were many people discussing uh, equity issues, especially racial equity issue, but there were so many that were not. And now all of a sudden, because it is popular to talk about it, everyone is all of a sudden courageous enough to even discuss the importance of racial equity. So I don't know how much more worse it could get for black people, considering our history in this country. Um, as a as a son of uh, as an ancestor of those who were enslaved in Mississippi, uh, Virginia, South Carolina and other places. I can only see the benefits from here. So I can only see things getting better. So, so thank you, thank you for that. But we are gonna transition now to, to the next question or a statement by our friend. Thank you, Gil. We are a unified force. We are a unified force. Very brief. Thank you all of you for do such hard work across the US. People are watching. I, li I live in Toronto in Canada and we are watching and we're learning from you. Tamika has been and Charles also in some webinars across Canada, but people in Latin America, I'm very close to the people all over Latin America. People are watching what is happening in the US, the good, the bad and the ugly, <laughs> and people are learning. So all, all your work is going beyond the borders. The thing that you are doing in LA, other cities, the thing that you are doing in different states, whatever. So thank you for the hard work because each one of you are an inspiration to people beyond the borders. Thank you. Thank hey, you. Hey, hey, we appreciate hey, Charles, you. Man. Yeah, Charles, we're going to bring on a bite. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you answer, but answer once one. We have uh, someone else coming on. I want to make sure we transition from our good brother, Gil, to the next gentleman who's been waiting. Um, let's bring him on, Eric Bailey. And then, Obai, as we're bringing Eric on, you can comment. Please do so. Hey, hey real quick. Uh, Gil, thanks for the, the comments. Um, I, I had the opportunity to go to Colombia, uh, Bogota, and experience um, Ciclovia in real time, in person. Uh, Jaime Ortiz founded Ciclovia. Uh, Gil took it to a next level. Um, we're watching Colombia. Y'all watching us, we're watching Colombia. The European model of cycling has failed black and brown neighborhoods. A model of cycling that is all about uh, transportation and is targeting commuters has failed our neighborhoods. The model that we're looking at, the model we're watching is Colombia where we're prioritizing socializing black people around increased mobility in our neighborhoods. So uh, that's my response. Thank you, Gil. Thank you, Obai. Let's quickly go to Veronica and then we're going to Eric Bailey. So uh, thank you, Gil, for your comments and bringing up the Hispanic community. Um, I will say the thing, even as we talk about the Hispanic community, you know, obviously we all know it's not a monolith, um, but even within the Hispanic community, there is challenges of colorism and racism for people who are white presenting, uh, you know, Hispanics, Latinos, and people who are Afro Latino or mestizo, all of those things. And so I think that even as we have those conversations about the Hispanic community, focusing on the Afro, the Afro Hispanic, the mestizo Hispanic, the indigenous Hispanic uh, communities, because, you know, I've been to Bogota as well. Um, I've also loved Cali, Colombia. And, you know, for me, it was very interesting being in Bogota, well, being in Cali, which is, you know, more, uh, more people of Afro African descent, and feeling welcome, feeling at home, feeling like, you know, I was in Atlanta, just everybody was speaking Spanish. Um, but my experiences in Bogota, I love the Ciclovia. I love the, all the infrastructure. Um, but going into a very high end mall and until people realized I was American, I was treated differently. Uh, you know, people were following me around the store, not to be helpful or supportive. They were following me around because they thought I was they thought I was Colombian. And then they figured out the minute they figured out I was American, I was treated differently. And so I think that, you know, as we talk about these issues, you know, Latin America is still challenged dealing with race. And so I think it's still the conversation is very applicable. Thank you, Veronica. And I'm also going to ask the panelists, let's everyone transition now to rapid fire response uh, so we can get through the questions. Uh, Brother Eric Bailey, please unmute yourself and ask your question. You're muted. Sorry about that. 
Well, uh, how's everybody doing? Uh, first things first, I want to thank everybody for putting on a phenomenal and compelling um, pre uh, presentation. Um, it's been very informative listening to everybody. And I don't really have so much of a question as it is a bit of a comment slash concern in the sense that uh, a little bit of background about myself. I've been a, a transit operator for nine years between two companies. And um, it's, it's refreshing to see so many faces of color that are uh, involved in transportation at the level that you are, because the concern that I have is um, a lot of the faces that move people around, whether it be bus, whether it be rail, whether it be paratransit, are people of color, but the further up uh, the ranks that you go, um, that color and that diversity starts to disappear very quickly um, as you move up the ranks. And um, for somebody who's worked on the front lines for as long as I have, um, internally, there really needs to be a pipeline to get people um, who move their communities around to be in uh, to get to positions that get to dictate how they move their communities around. Um, as someone who returned to college um, and was able to finish school, I'm still seeing that there, there, there still really isn't even a pipeline to where if you're from here or if you start down here, you get up there. Because even if you do it the traditional way that they tell you, go back to school, do this, do that, you still kind of run into challenges because you started here. So I think that there really needs to be an emphasis internally in transportation companies to say, if you start from the bottom, how do you get to the top? Because right now that doesn't exist. Thank you. What brought you here, Eric? Um, so I'm, I'm friends with Juan Matute, um, who... Uh, kind of spearheads a symposium. And uh, I, I attended, I want to say last year, and I really liked it. And, and again, I think that um, the way transportation works is there really aren't a lot of people on the front lines who chime into these kind of conversations. Um, and that's where you're getting the most experience. That's where you're getting the most hands-on knowledge of the way people move around cities. So for that group of people to not be in, in, uh, at the table in these kind of conversations, I think is um, it's it's lacking, and I don't think that you're getting the full picture of how we can make things better if you're not getting an opinion from everybody involved. Thank you, thank you, Eric. We we agree. Um, Veronica, you have a statement. Yeah, just really quickly. Um, I think to Eric's point, um, a lot of times, even in projects done by consultants, as Obai was saying earlier. Um, operators are never engaged on the planning process. I had a project where we were looking at uh, doing bus lanes, but we had several meetings with the bus operators because they're, they do have much more knowledge. I can send all the planners, all the engineers, whatever, to observe the bus. But for someone who's driving it every day, that sees it every day, that knows that route, they can tell you all the little things about what some of the issues are. And some of the problems that the bus drivers are having were just so minor. We didn't have to go through an entire planning process just to fix that one particular issue. And so I do hope that more consultants, more governments bring in the operators into those planning level discussions. Yeah, and I would also add, uh, Brother Eric, please know that while we may have these high positions, we still have brothers and sisters on the front lines uh, my brother is an operator out of Mississippi. Uh, he does travel all over the U.S. hauling goods and services. And he talks to me at nauseum about some of the issues that he's facing. So we are very close to the issues. And we always appreciate people like yourself being here to kind of remind us of that important connection that we have. Thank you, Eric. Can I add one last note? Um, Eric, thank you for being here. I know that it's hard, especially in that type of a position to be able to carve out some time to show up in a space like this. So I appreciate you um, taking the time to join a learning space because um, we need to make that more available to all of our workforce. Like it is our planners and our engineers and folks that are sitting at their desk and who are teleworking right now, who usually have access to these more professional kind of development spaces. We need to change that. Um, maybe a model that we can offer is at PBOT, we embarked a year and some change ago on a journey to be a more transportation justice oriented organization. And with that established a internal staff committee of about 35 folks from across our organization. We have a workforce of a thousand um, 
most of the diversity is either new to the organization, so been with us for less than three years, they're seasonal workers, they're operational workers, they're construction workers, or they're like inspectors. So especially in the time of COVID have been on the front lines out in the streets, managing and maintaining and continuing the work of our transportation system, but often don't get to be in the spaces where they can offer opinions, ideas, innovation, um, solutions. So we're cultivating that work, but the work, um, you know, to what also Tamika spoke to earlier, like we're not being very intentional about how we're cultivating those parts of our workforce and how we're talking about the trajectory of their careers to move up or to move through the organization or the industry as they want to. Um, so I definitely would encourage our audience to consider all of those factors, but, uh, but um, consider how that shows up in your own, own organization and what you can do about it. Nidra. I just want to add to your point, Eric, about and highlight uh, the idea of young people, starting with young people. I come from the social service. I'm a social worker and I worked in a talent search program. So it's helping non-traditional first, uh, first person in their family to college. And part of that is a lot of kids, if they make it that far, they want to make money so they can help their families. But understanding that not every kid is going to college or there are other ways to um, earn a good living and support their family and communities is important. So that you know, we're looking at remedies and putting funding into remedies, funding social service programs to support young people in their academic and professional pursuits is a good place to start. Thank you. Um, please welcome Sarah Jones. Sarah, you have the floor. Oh, thanks. So I had, I had to unmute. Um, so I really appreciate um, Irene being here. And I also really appreciate what Eric just said, because that's um, kind of the uh, the where my question was coming from, too, which is that, um, you know, within a public agency, our hiring and promotional uh, requirements and and practices are so constrained and really so much feel like they're about compliance and avoiding challenges and so keep getting pushed to objective stuff and it's like every you know every change in the process that comes around pushes us farther and farther away from being able to value the expertise of lived experience and specifically um you know being able to value what um, black and brown people coming into planning, um, including non-planners. Like, I really want to get people um, who have worked in transportation and worked in their communities, but don't have to be trained as planners, um, want to get them into doing this work. Um, so, you know, I have a feeling that PBOT um, sounds like you've made some progress around um, being able to um, really push towards uh, towards inclusion and diversity rather than compliance. Um, and I'm wondering if there are other examples as well. And I would add to that based on what Eric said, also ways to bring, um, you know, the voices of operators within the challenges of schedules. And, you know, really, it's very hard for us to um, take operators time um, and bring them into doing this kind of work. So I'm, I'd love um, thoughts and ideas, uh, and just you know, we're working really hard on on dealing with those um, barriers that exist, um, and just you know, really looking for um, ways to do that. Thank you. Anyone want to take that on quickly? Maybe if I can offer two starting notes. Um, one, compliance is also Title VI. Compliance is also ADA. So I think we rest on what are transportation compliance factors, um, but we don't go deep on civil rights and disability access, which are also federal requirements for a lot of the funding that we get. And I think we definitely in that regard need to build out um, because Title VI and ADA are about the impact of our work, not just the fact that we did some type of public involvement and that we put a couple hundred dollars into that on a multi-million dollar project. So I think we need to take that portion of our compliance a lot more seriously. That's how we get to some of these issues. And then on our workforce specifically, um, 
I won't go too deep on this, but I would say the unions definitely play a role, especially in the public sector. And there's a lot of work to do around how our unions also show up as allies in um, in this space and for the cultivation of our workforce because they have a huge, huge amount of impact. Thank you. Last time we got together, team, um, I asked you a question that I, I want to repeat now, which is how powerful or powerless do you feel at the moment? Let's start with you, Tamika. Where are you at? I know you, uh, your blood sugar was low, now you're good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Are you feeling more powerful or powerless now? I, I feel more powerful now that I had my bougie acai bowl. Um, thank you for normalizing eating while speaking. So, you know, I think I, think I know that, that we have power, right? Like, I, uh, when when Naomi won the U.S. Open, I think she said something like, "With my ancestors' blood in my veins, like I, I knew I like I can't lose, right?" And so, like as as a black person, um, particularly as a black woman, like we always figure it out. And so, in that sense, I feel immense power. I think in this industry, I have been made to feel on multiple occasions like I don't have power. Um, but, but more than I don't have power, like I don't have intelligence or I don't have value. Who made you and feel think, that way? I mean, people would say, is that barbershop, barbershop talk? Who made you feel that way? I mean, I don't think we have enough time, <laughs> but I think I, you know, I, I think when you look, when I'm a, I'm a, my background is as an employment lawyer. And so I focus on employment discrimination. And I think we have to start realizing that when we look at the resumes of folks of color and we just say, well, they bounce around a lot or they can only make it in this sector or that sector. We don't talk about the structures that they are a part of and, and what type of person of color is viewed as acceptable and what type of person of color is viewed as a distraction or as a disruptor, right? Everyone likes to have you on a panel to say provocative things. But when you actually try to help, when you do a service, when, when people are surrounded with you all the time and your full self, like nothing makes folks as uncomfortable as Black folks with confidence, nothing. Mm. And, and, and that's just... I, I don't know why that's scary, right? And I don't know why that makes people feel the need to devalue us and put us on, in our place and keep us in the field and keep us where they think we should be. Um, do, I, do I have power? Do I feel powerful? Absolutely. Um, because every single day, I'm reminded that my brilliance and my intelligence and my compassion and my empathy and my desire to do this work and create deep change scares somebody. And, and that means I have to keep going. Obai, are you powerful or powerless at this moment? No question. I'm powerful. <laughs> and we are powerful. Black folks are powerful. Um, the challenge we have is that we've been convinced we're not powerful. And we have no power. We don't, we don't harness it because we don't believe we have it. Yes, we are powerful. A few years ago, myself and other Black folks here in Chicago, we, uh, we advocated for a canceling of a Vision Zero Summit hosted by Active Transportation Alliance. And everybody told us, y'all wasting y'all time. Uh, million dollars organization, y'all new scrappy grassroots. What y'all doing? Ain't nobody about to cancel that summit. They paid for it. They got the space. They charging people. Two weeks later, it was canceled. Because we refuse to believe that we're not powerful. So, yeah, we got power. We got to harness it. We got to go out. We got to have some specific advocacy agendas. And when we all work together, we can have some wins. I don't I don't I don't doubt it at all. Nidra. How are you at the moment feeling powerful or powerless? Um, I am feeling powerful. I think I said this the last time that. In the past few months, there's been more collective organizing and cooperative working togetherness. And so that has made me feel way more powerful um, versus being alone kind of in my space, um, speaking my truth. Um, I think having a support of people who look like me and then 
some white people who are allies actually learning how to be a good ally. Um, it shows that it's been the pain and suffering has been for naught and that I want to continue doing that. So I feel very encouraged, um, affirmed and also powerful. Veronica. So the last time I answered this, uh, I felt I said powerless because I was just going through some things. Um, so I'll say I do feel powerful in that. Um, so when I stand on the sh shoulders of some really strong and awesome ancestors, period, um, I feel powerful in being able to connect with some really awesome black people in this space, adjacent to this space. Um, you know, the fact that I have my text me message chains you know, with my people, my different little tribes and, you know, can and, and can get my cup full up as well as fill another's cup. And I also feel powerful in that, you know, it's one of those things where if my if our power wasn't a threat, then people wouldn't. There's no need to do anything. Right. Like if you are a competitor and somebody is weak, then it's just like, let me just go ahead and do my thing. But it's like when people know they're going up against Serena Williams, one of the things that Serena Williams talked about in an interview was one of the reasons why she is the best, because everyone plays her at their best because they know she's the best. And so everybody comes ready to play against her in a tennis match, whatever you whatever you say, you say it. But I think that in that sense, I feel like that's where we are, um, mainly because of our, our power is threatening. Um, and our power is threatening. And that's why it's well, let me constantly trip you up. Right. Like so if our power wasn't threatening, then I don't need to come after Tamika and be like, why are you so angry? Why are you doing these things? I don't have to attack her if I feel like she is she's weak, if you will. Um, you know, or I don't have to, you know, uh, minimize you as a person. Right. So there is something there is something that's very powerful in all of us that people feel threatened. And I think part of the threat is it almost comes off this fear of we are going to treat them as we are being treated. And that's just not as the space that we operate in. Um, and so I feel like that's what's happening now, you know, even in these conversations in this country around race, right? So now you have white men that are like, oh, but I, I feel so threatened and, and all these things. And I'm just trying to be a good person. And not all of us don't have empathy. And you're in this like, not all, not all, not all, not all. And it's like you're missing. You're completely missing the point. You know, we are not here to oppress you. Right. Like part of that power share is we don't want power to oppress you. You know, that is that that is not the end game. And I think that that is how it's being treated. And so there's something powerful in some of these conversations that we're having. So discussions about identity aren't always welcome in, in these transportation spaces. Uh, Tamika, I've known you for some time. You're unapologetically who you are. You represent it. You stand on it. Irene, when I met you, we've had conversations about the fact that you're biracial. Uh, Veronica, you talked about the importance of being a female engineer, what that means to you. Obaya, you've just been an unapologetically black male from day one. And Nidra, you are a black social worker. When we, when we think about intersectionality, why is that important, this identity and being yourself in the context of transportation? And how does that get us further along the path of finding the solutions we need to find? Um, it is, gonna, sorry. It's important to look at our full identities. Um, history has kind of shaped who we are, and so to speak. Um, if we're looking at um, the experiences of Black people, to understand that and to put that learnings into practice, we really do have to look at the full system. And that's a historical lens, it's a social lens, understanding how our communities have been shaped and formed, our families, um, some of the barriers we faced. So looking at full identities will create a holistic approach that will incorporate the pieces that are needed to bring about um, solutions that, um, that allow people to exist and feel like they belong. Um, like we use story, storytelling, history, um, events to talk about place. And we do that because it says that, you know, these people were here, black people, people of color, immigrant people, queer folks, um, like all these people were here. You know, they, they put this, their selves, their energy, they created something, they designed something um, 
they flourished, you know, created a culture. And if without that, there is a void. There's like, why do we even care? And I think we have been written in a way that's been, that we've been told that we didn't create something. We didn't have the ingenuity. We didn't have, but that is just the opposite. So creating um, a holistic approach will allow us to be fully seen and visible. So um, that's from a social work self, that's from a historical self, um, and just a person who lives. Oh, bye. Why is identity or self-identifying even more so important? Uh, yeah, it's, it's critical. I'm a black man born on the land, Chicago, South Side, West Side. However y'all want to do it, we can do it because that's how I was raised, rumble tumble in a hard scrabble city like Chicago. I also struggle with depression. And we've seen what that looks like when um, cops are called to deal with someone who's uh, having a mental health crisis. Um, it's critical. It's critical because while we recognize the intersections for ourselves and the work that we do, many don't. Many ignore it completely. Even when it hits them in the face, they continue to ignore it. Mobility and policing are inextricably linked. And there's still people thinking that this is all about uh, uh, traffic, reducing traffic violence without addressing what it means to reduce traffic violence with an enforcement uh, strategy in black and brown communities. Um, I give you an example. Uh, Vision Zero Network. Yeah, we're going to call them out. Vision Zero Network put out a statement that is laughable from beginning to end because they talk about their commitment to being anti-racist. Uh, they they want to suggest that cities re remove police enforcement. We told them that five years ago, perhaps 10 years ago. They said no. They said no to my face. We're not taking enforcement out of Vision Zero. And now they got something uh, uh, written on, on a blog talking about their commitment to being anti-racist. Um, those, those types of efforts from Vision Zero Network People for Bikes, Transalt, Bike New York, uh, Bicycle Coalition of Greater Philadelphia, the League of American Bicyclists, Safe Routes to School, and many, many more. Active Transportation uh, in Chicago, Active Transportation Alliance, Metropolitan Planning Council, uh, Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, Road to Zero Coalition. I could go on and on. Those efforts are harmful in our neighborhoods. Your silence is violence. It's deadly in our neighborhoods when you're not intersectional. Thank you, Abai. Irene, then Veronica, and Tamika. Then we'll close out. Yeah, I um, you know, in this country, we are everybody's putting a bucket. <laughs> you have to identify with whatever the Census Bureau says, or you know, whatever whoever is categorizing us as data. Um, my experience actually starts in a tiny country called Dominica. That's where I was born and where my maternal lineage is from. Uh, my father's white American man who was in the Peace Corps was there for five years. And honestly, we probably wouldn't have come back to, the, I might have grown up in Dominica had his program not forced him to come back to the States. Like that's why I'm here. So everything, every policy, every, there are so many things that have informed the trajectory of my life because I wasn't born here because I have a black mother who, um, you know, I grew up in the one of the widest communities and one of the widest cities in America. <laughs> like that informs all of my experience. Um, but also it kind of helped to helped me to understand the complexities of um, our lives and all of the things that help inform the way we show up in space, the way we want to show up in space, um, and the things that make us feel proud and powerful. Um, I also went to Howard University where I got to be in a space with all types of diversity of Blackness. And that is really ultimately what not just shaped my identity, but really helped to embolden me to um, to show up authentically as myself and with all my complexity and all my background. Um, but I think that that's a part of what makes me successful in this space. Um, not only that I have the education and skill set and um, career path to help me be productive, but also that I bring with me what my colleagues don't. I bring a lived experience. I bring a history. I bring a connection to colonization. I bring like so many other things that in this space, my colleagues read about, you know, it's a data point, it's a report they read, it's a 
country they visited. Um, when we can show up as ourselves with our rich lived experiences, we can make our spaces stronger, more complex. Um, we can be innovative. We can compete across the world. So I think we need to continue to encourage this um, in all the ways. I also want to say, you know, I'm just, I think growing up, I wasn't proud to be a Black Oregonian, but in this moment, in this year, you know, Black Oregonians have gotten $62 million worth of CARES Act funding to be directed specifically towards the Black community in Oregon. We have been able to be successful in demanding um, a whole lot of policy and legislation and um, just process improvements in our political systems and climate. Um, and there's lots of ways, and we're on 127 days, I think, of protests also in our city since the murder of George Floyd. So I bring with me a connection to all of that um, in a way that I think that, you know, we as an organization are better because of that lived experience, but with every single individual that we're able to bring into the space with a similarly diverse background, we become a richer, a richer organization for it. Thank you. Veronica, then Tamika. Um, so I love being Black. Uh, and I think the great thing about being Black is we can travel the world, right? We can go to as Colombia, we can go to Nicaragua, we can go to wherever, but it's, and we don't even have to speak the same language, but we are able to look at each other. It's like, we have like this connection and we're able to look at each other and have this connection with each other. And so that's why it's important to hire people within your organizations, you know, particularly as you're working in black communities, because we have an ability to connect with our own communities that, you know, as Irene was saying, you could read about it, right? Like you can watch, you could even watch TV and kind of get a peek into what you think is uh, the black community, but it's just something that's innate in us. And it doesn't matter whether you grew up in Dominica, it doesn't matter where you are. It's, and we have our own nuances, but there is a connection that we have about being black. And that's not something that could be taught or learned. It's a language that we have. Um, you know, I'll never forget when I was in Cali, Colombia, people were like, mi prima, mi prima, right? Like, and it's just like, oh, but you're family, right? Because you, you, you look like us, you're one of us, and you are family. And that's not something that, like I said, can be taught or manufactured. You know, within the engineering world, you know, we are, we're just, we are underrepresented. Um, and the interesting thing, even when it comes to women, even when it comes to um, black people, brown people, we're graduating with engineering degrees. But when you look at the percentage of us at graduation and those of us that are making it through in the field, there's a huge drop off. And a lot of that comes to you hire black faces, but you're not giving you, we are we are treated and held to a completely different and unrealistic standard as our peers. Right. Um, and so therefore, people people roll out. We are treated differently in that we are called angry. We are called emotional. We are called all these things. And it gets written in our HR reports. And so we leave because we can't even authentically be ourselves and fully be present in ourselves when we show up at work. Right. We have to be like you. We have to form to company culture. Right. Which at the end of the day is really about white culture. So we we're constantly conforming and acting and performing. We're doing the jig you know, from nine to five. And it gets exhausting when you can't be your full authentic self. Um, and then even if you are hiring young, you know, black engineers, there's no leadership. I mean, I worked at it before I started my own company. I worked at an engineering firm with 180 vice presidents. There was one black male VP, one female black woman VP, and neither of them were on the technical side. And so it's like, I got to, you so I'm answering to a bunch of old white men who are my bosses and who don't understand me, you know, even just me and who I am and, and the needs that I have as a person. Um, and so therefore it's not just about hiring black people. It's about elevating people to leadership. We read your statements. We saw your anti-racist statements and guess what? We went and clicked and look at your board and your board is all white. Your leadership of your board is all white. Your executive leadership team is all white. Maybe you have a black person as like your director of HR. Maybe it's so maybe a bl old black woman who's your HR director. But other than that, you're not elevating us. And part of that isn't just about putting us in position and then being like, oh, well, you failed. You weren't qualified. It's putting us in the position and giving us the same mentorship, the same guidance and pour into us the same way you do other people, because there's enough mediocre white men that are leading these organizations that I find it very hard to believe that 
you can't take, let us be mediocre, right? We're allowed to be mediocre too. And you should be able to pour into us and provide us the mentorship to be successful, to lead your organizations. Thank you. To make your closes out as quickly as you can. It's, it's tough, right? Like, I feel like we can talk forever. Um, but I think this piece about how is identity important? Identity and showing up as your full self at work, if that is not important to you, then I feel bad for you. But also, it's just like such a white people thing, right? Like, we all grew up in families where something happened on TV or something happened with one of your friends and your parents looked at you and said, mm-mm. That's some white people shit. You ain't doing that. We've all had those moments. And that's exactly what it is to show up at work and not bring these other identities to the table, to show up at work and be like, this is my professional time. And what I do in my private life is my private life. But don't worry, I donate to the right you know, elected officials. I donate to the right charities, but this is professional. And the reality is an ability to separate the professional from the personal is white people shit. And we don't have the privilege to do that. And the reason we don't have the privilege to do it is because white people don't do it for us. They never don't see my black face. And so when you tell me to show up and just be professional and not bring my queerness, not bring my blackness, not bring my Midwesternness, not bring my background as a nonprofit person, like when you tell me not to do that, but then you constantly put me down, you constantly, as Veronica said, won't put me on the technical stuff because you don't think I'm experienced enough, then you're the one who's not allowing me to separate. You're the one who's always seeing that and only seeing that. And I think several of us have said that things have been triggered for us today because we know it. This was huge for this conference to let us talk about what happened last year, to let us come back and come harder. But this can't be only our work. Tony asked a question in the comments. You know, he agitates, they agitate where they can, but like, what about the broader picture? And the reality is, I'm not going to say that people of color and particularly black folks, because anti-blackness is different than racism, but I'm not going to say we can't solve this problem on our own because we can do anything. But what I am saying is we're going to solve this problem and we're going to live and we're going to live full lives and it's going to be sustainable and we're going to get it done with the urgency that it needs to be done. Then white people got to put on their big girl panties, buck the fuck up and get in this fight with us. And that's what we need you to do, because you might not think your life depends on it, but I guarantee you are depending on folks of color. You are depending on black folks and everybody's always depending on black women to save the day. And so you might not think you're like us, but you need us. And what's so scary is that there's these realizations that we might not need you. And that's not who we are. We want to do this together. We want to do this collectively. We want to share power. But just know that just because we're here, just because we're willing not to hold on to grudges and to move forward, we are not waiting and we are not begging for folks to accept our dignity and our place. We're taking it. We're here and we're not going anywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica, Tamika, Jerron, Nidra, Obai, and Irene, also UCLA. Thank you again to the National Center for Sustainable Transportation for sponsoring this session. Our next session is this afternoon at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time and features research presentations on the mobility of vulnerable populations during COVID-19. But first, we will be moving into breakout rooms. Check the chat for the breakout room link. Once you join the Zoom main meeting room, you will be able to self-select into a room. You may need to close the webinar window in order to participate in the breakout session. Thank you to Arab for sponsoring our breakout session this morning. Again, my name is Charles Brown. It's been a pleasure being here with you all today. Uh, Enjoy your day. For more information, visit UCLA Arrowhead Symposium.org. Thank you.